Hi, I'm Sachin Goel. I'm the Medical Director for Structural Heart Interventions at Houston Methodist Hospital. And I'm going to talk to you today about current trends in use and outcomes of left atrial appendage closure. Here are my disclosures. So here's the outline of the talk. Uh, we'll talk about the Watchman device randomized trials, followed by the Watchman Flex data, which includes the Pinnacle Flex registry, the NCDR LAO registry, and data from the SURPASS uh, uh, registry. Um, we'll talk about the peri device leak and device related thrombus, uh, followed by some data on amulet and ongoing trials. So as a brief introduction, um, we know that the incidence and prevalence of atrial fibrillation is increasing and there are expected to be more than 12 million patients with atrial fibrillation by 2030 in the United States. Uh, AFib increases the risk of stroke uh, risk by fivefold. 25% of all ischemic strokes are associated with atrial fibrillation. Uh, direct oral anticoagulants have become the mainstay for stroke prevention due to lower risk of intracranial hemorrhage compared with vitamin K antagonists or warfarin. And over 250,000 patients have been treated with left atrial appendage closure worldwide. And this, of course, is the, is the main risk uh, with atrial fibrillation is the development of left atrial appendage thrombus, which increases the risk of stroke. Um, however, we all know that many patients are not great candidates for continued oral anticoagulation due to risk of bleeding. Uh, and in some patients, in fact, the anticoagulants are, are contraindicated. So this is the patient population where left atrial appendage closure has been studied and developed and has grown tremendously over the last 20 years. This is a timeline. Uh, transcatheter left atrial appendage started in 2002. Uh, and we'll talk about the randomized trials, both the PROTECT AF, uh, which was uh, uh, earlier in 2005, followed by PREVAIL in 2010, uh, and then a couple of registries, which led to the Watchman approval in the United States by the FDA in 2015. Uh, followed by uh, some more registry data. And then 2019 is when the Watchman Flex device uh, was approved in the, uh, in the European Union, followed by the US FDA approval for the Watchman Flex in 2020. And then finally, uh, the other randomized trials which are ongoing, such as Champion AFib. And then uh, the Watchman Flex Pro device has finally achieved FDA approval in 2023. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these devices and some of the major trials and registries. So the PROTECT AFib was the first uh, randomized trial which enrolled patients with atrial fibrillation who were at increased risk of stroke and also bleeding. Uh, they enrolled patients between 2005 and 2008 and the primary efficacy endpoint was stroke, systemic embolization or cardiovascular death and the primary safety endpoint was a composite of major bleeding events and procedure related complications. Patients were followed out to four years and on the left, you can see the primary efficacy endpoint was not only non-inferior, but also superior in favor of the Watchman device arm. The efficacy, the safety endpoint uh, was similar with no difference between the device and the warfarin arm. Uh, when you look at the components of ischemic stroke, uh, there was no difference between the device and warfarin. However, on long-term follow-up, there was a statistically significant difference in favor of the device arm with regards to cardiovascular mortality risk reduction and all-cause mortality risk reduction. So these are very important findings from five, four, from four-year data. So after four years, 3.8 years of follow-up in patients with non-valvular AFib at elevated risk of stroke, percutaneous LAA closure met criteria for both non-inferiority and superiority compared with warfarin therapy for preventing the combined outcome of stroke, systemic embolism, or cardiovascular death as well as superiority for cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality. Um, the initial, uh, these are initial uh, data for the Watchman device, and one of the important uh, findings here was the pericardial effusion, which was around 4.8%. This obviously led the FDA to mandate another trial before approving this de device in the United States. And that second trial was the PREVAIL randomized trial, which enrolled patients with atrial fibrillation, non-valvular AFib, with Chad's VASC score of two or more, um, and patients were randomized to warfarin versus the Watchman device. Uh, These patients were enrolled between 2010 and 2012, and the left atrial appendage occlusion was found to be non-inferior to warfarin for ischemic stroke prevention or systemic embolization after first seven days, and non-inferiority was not achieved, however, for the overall efficacy endpoint, but the event rates were low uh, 
and similar in both arms. Uh, based on these two randomized trials, the FDA approved uh, the Watchman device uh, in 2015 uh, in the United States. Subsequently, the five-year outcomes uh, from both Protect and Prevail uh, were analyzed and a patient-level meta-analysis was performed. Um, and they found that left atrial appendage closure with Watchman device provides stroke prevention uh, in patients with non-valvular AFib to a similar degree as oral anticoagulation with warfarin. However, important findings compared with warfarin, left atrial appendage closure was associated with a significant reduction in hemorrhagic stroke, disabling or fatal stroke, major bleeding, all-cause mortality, and cardiovascular mortality. So these are very important findings from long-term outcomes of these trials. The third randomized trial that we will talk about uh, is the Prague 17 trial. Uh, this is a, uh, a European trial, 10 centers in the Czech Republic uh, between 2015 and 2019. Uh, mean age of the patients was 73. Uh, mean Chad's was 4.7. Um, history of cardioembolism was present in about a third of the patients. Um, history of significant bleed was present in about 48% uh, patients. Um, and 400 patients were randomized uh, to left atrial appendage closure uh, versus a direct oral anticoagulant. So this is the first trial, uh, completed trial, looking at left atrial appendage closure versus a DOAC. Remember the PROTECT and the PREVAIL were left atrial appendage closure versus warfarin. So this is more contemporary. This is uh, very important data. Uh, so the primary endpoint of stroke, TIA, systemic embolism, CV death, bleeding or complications, uh, left atrial appendage closure was found to be non-inferior to DOAC therapy in the initial publication uh, to two and a half years. And as you can see, the, uh, the major advantage of the left atrial appendage closure was a significant reduction in non-procedural uh, uh, bleeding, uh, which was of course more common in the DOAC group. Subsequently, the four-year follow-up was published from the DOAC, uh, from the Prague 17 trial. And you can see that uh, non-procedural related clinically relevant bleeding was more common in the DOAC group. And it was very reassuring again to see similar rates of systemic embolism and stroke uh, between left atrial appendage closure and DOAC groups out to four years without signal of late ischemic events in the left atrial appendage uh, closure group. This is uh, obviously something that is uh, important. Um, you know, and we'll talk about device-related thrombus and risk of stroke, but at least in the Prague 17 uh, randomized trial, we did not see an increased risk of systemic embolism or stroke out to four years. Um, at four years, 13% uh, of the patients in the DOAC group had stopped the oral anticoagulation. Um, finally, this is a recent meta-analysis of all the randomized control trials, the PROTECT AF, uh, PREVAIL, uh, and the Prague 17. And as you can see in this forest plot, the risk of stroke Ischemic stroke uh, was no different between left atrial appendage closure versus anticoagulation. However, there were benefits with left atrial appendage closure with regards to a reduction in risk of hemorrhagic stroke, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and non-procedure-related major bleeding. So these are all in favor of the left atrial appendage closure. What about registry data? So the NCDR has a left atrial appendage uh, occlusion or LA closure registry. Uh, which is managed by the FDA. Uh, so the first publication was uh, uh, included almost 38,000 patients, 38,000 watchman procedures performed between 2016 and 2018, uh, over uh, almost 500 hospitals and 1,300 physicians. The median number of procedures at that time was about 30 per hospital and 12 per MD. Uh, mean age was 76, and Chad's VASC score was 4.6. As you can see uh, on the right side, the number of procedures obviously has continued to increase over that duration um, in the United States. And here are the outcome um, uh, data. So on the left side, you can see any major complication was 2.16%. Death was very low at 0.19%. Stroke or TIA, 0.17%. Major bleeding, 1.25%. And pericardial effusion requiring an intervention was down to 1.39%. Remember from the earlier slides, in the first trial in the PROTECT AFib, the incidence of pericardial effusion was about 4.8%, which is why the FDA mandated another trial. But with increasing experience, uh, you can see from an all-comer registry uh, standpoint, the, the incidence of pericardial effusion has gone down tremendously to 1.39%. And then the implant success rates have also continued to Im improve and increase over the duration of the last uh, two decades. Uh, what about the Watchman Flex? So the Watchman Flex is the next generation left atrial appendage closure, and here are the differences between the original Watchman device and the Watchman Flex device. As you can see, the, the, the device is much shorter, 
It has dual row of uh, anchors. It has a larger size range, so we can treat a wider range of patient anatomy with the Watchman Flex compared to the Watchman. The distal tines are folded backwards in the Watchman Flex, which makes this device uh, safer. The risk of uh, pericardial effusion is lower, as you will see in the subsequent slides. There are greater number of struts, which provide better apposition. And uh, also there is reduced metal exposure. Uh, and uh, the idea is to reduce the risk of peri-device leak and device-related thrombus. And we'll go over some of this data. So the, the Pinnacle Flex was a prospective non-randomized multi-center US FDA study, which included 400 patients. Average age was 73.8. Chad's Vasco 4.2, Hasblad of 2.0. About a third were women. And as you can see, the primary safety endpoints, all-cause death, zero. Ischemic stroke, 0.5%. Systemic embolism, zero. Device or procedure-related events requiring surgery or major intervention, zero. And the uh, peri-procedural adverse events uh, was down to 0.5%. And this clearly met the uh, one-sided statistical significance for non-inferiority. Uh, the pinnacle flex ischemic stroke and uh, systemic uh, embolism rates you can see on this slide are very low, 0.7% in the first seven days, 3% out to one year. And then from between one year and uh, uh, two years, only one additional patient with ischemic event. So overall, uh, the, the device um, was found to be very safe in this uh, registry. Device-related thrombus occurred in seven patients. Uh, no patient experienced pericardial effusion requiring cardiac surgery, and there were no device embolizations in this registry. And here are the uh, outcomes out to two years. Um, and you can see uh, the incidence of systemic embolism is 0.3%, device-related thrombus 1.8%, pericardial effusion now is down to 0.5%, uh, which is even better compared to the NCDRLAO registry uh, with the Watchman Flex device. Uh, and the outcomes are uh, divided into zero to one year and one to two years. Uh, when you look at the antithrombotic regimen used in the Pinnacle Flex registry, vast majority of these patients were still treated with anticoagulation for the first uh, six weeks, as was uh, done in the randomized trials, the Protect AFib and Prevail. Uh, but these are all treated with DOAX now, as opposed to warfarin in the Prevail and Protect AFib. And oral anticoagulation discontinuation after 45-day follow-up was achieved in 96% of patients due to adequate sealing of the device. Um, what about real-world experience? So this was uh, uh, presented in the SURPASS registry. Uh, SURPASS registry is, was designed to assess the outcomes with Watchman Flex in a routine clinical setting. Uh, this included patients in the NCDR LAO registry uh, between 2020 and March 2022. And outcomes were evaluated through one year. Uh, you can see the cadence uh, uh, and patient flow. There were 66,000 patients uh, um, who were discharged after the LA occlusion with the uh, Watchman Flex. 45-day uh, follow-up was available in 61,000 patients, and one-year follow-up was available in about 18,000 patients. And here are the patient characteristics. Again, very similar to the previous trials, age of 76, Chad's Vasco 4.8, has blood score of 2.1, 40% uh, women, procedural characteristics in the bottom, successful implantation in almost 98% of patients, um, length of stay 1.9 day, days, same day discharge in about 30% patients. The discharge medications, again, um, a vast majority of these were treated with anticoagulation, either direct oral anticoagulant or warfarin. Uh, only 8% DAP to use at the time. Um, the key safety events you can see on this slide, uh, all-cause death 0.18%. Uh, ischemic stroke 0.13%, systemic embolism 0%, device or procedure related events re requiring intervention 0.2%. So very low uh, risk of adverse events uh, with this uh, all-comer registry uh, from the NCDR. Uh, here you can see in hospital outcomes, pericardial effusion 0.38%. So this keeps getting better and better uh, with uh, the newer generation device. Um, major vascular complication 0.1%, systemic embolism 0.003%, very low rates. When you look at out to discharge, pericardial effusion 0.5%, uh, systemic embolism 0.01%, all cause stroke 0.3%. And then here are one year outcomes uh, all death is 8%, all stroke 1.6%, systemic embolism 0.1%, and bleeding 6.7%. Um, when you look at the ceiling, which is an important uh, aspect, and we are learning more about the, the ceiling and the peri-device leak, complete seal was achieved in 96% of patients. 
And you know, in the original uh, randomized trials, protect and prevail, a leak of more than five millimeter was considered to be significant. And you can see based on uh, this registry, the incidence of leak more than five millimeters was very low out to one year, only 0.7%. However, there are still uh, a number of uh, smaller leaks, zero to three millimeters and three to five millimeters. As you can see out to one year, 12% and 2.8%. And uh, this is uh, an area of growing interest, and we'll talk about this and present some data on this. Uh, here are the Watchman Flex procedural success across the trials and registries. Again, very high procedural success rates, upwards of 98%, uh, based on the surpass registry. Um, the Watchman 2.5 and the Watchman Flex were also compared um, in the, within the NCDR um, left atrial appendage occlusion registry. And again, the in-hospital incidence of major adverse events was found to be substantially lower with the Watchman Flex device compared to the Watchman uh, 2.5 device uh, with regards to mortality, cardiac arrest, pericardial effusion requiring intervention, major bleeding, uh, device embolization, you name it. All of these adverse events were significantly lower with the Watchman Flex compared to the old Watchman 2.5. And here is the, uh, the graph uh, showing the incidence of these uh, adverse events. You can see the pericardial effusion down from 1.2% with the 2.5 Watchman device to 0.4% with the Watchman Flex. Device embolization down from 0.06 to 0.02%. Major vascular complications also uh, very low 0.1%. Major bleeding down from 2% to 1%. So overall, uh, the risk of adverse events have continued to de decrease and decline uh, um, with the Watchman Flex device, and this has become the, uh, the Watchman device of choice in the United States. So what about the guidelines? Who should get a left atrial appendage closure? So these are the most recent ACC, AHA, and Heart Rhythm Society atrial fibrillation guidelines, uh, which were just published in January of this year. And um, you can see it is a class 2A indication in patients with atrial fibrillation who are at moderate to high risk of stroke, defined as Chad's VASC score of 2 or more, and a contraindication, which we will go over, uh, to long-term oral anticoagulation due to a non-reversible cause, a percutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion is reasonable. The class 2B is for patients with AFib at moderate to high risk of stroke, again, similar chads vask criteria. Uh, left atrial appendage closure may be reasonable alternative to oral anticoagulation based on patient preference with careful consideration of procedural risk and with the understanding that the evidence for oral anticoagulation is, of course, more extensive uh, to date. And so these are the patients that the guidelines uh, uh, recommend a two-way indication. The long-term anticoagulation is contraindicated uh, on this column on the left side. Patients with severe bleeding due to a non-reversible cause involving the GI, pulmonary, or GU systems. Spontaneous intracranial or intraspinal bleed due to a non-reversible cause. Serious bleeding related to recurrent falls when the cause of falls is felt to be non-treatable. This is an important um, patient population, um, as we see older and older patients, um, this is uh, not uncommon. And then long-term anticoagulation is still reasonable when the bleeding uh, involving the GI, GU, or pulmonary systems is treatable. Uh, bleeding is related to isolated trauma and bleeding related to procedure complications. So in these patients, uh, long-term anticoagulation may be still reasonable after a brief period of interruption um, to deal with the bleeding issues. Um, so these are the guidelines. Uh, moving on, what have we learned from the surgical left atrial appendage closure? Uh, you all know the LAAOS3 trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. This was a multi-center trial. Um, patients with atrial fibrillation, Chad's VASC of two or more, who were undergoing cardiac surgery for some reason. Um, they were randomized to left atrial appendage occlusion, uh, over 2,300 patients, versus no occlusion in usual care, including oral anticoagulation, in about 2,300 patients. The primary outcome was ischemic stroke or systemic embolism during follow-up. And what did we find out? So in this study, the patients who underwent left atrial appendage occlusion uh, did far better than patients where the appendage was left uh, uh, open at the time of cardiac surgery um, uh, out to five years. And you can see in all patient subgroups on the right side, you can see uh, no matter how the data was evaluated, uh, all patients benefited from left atrial appendage closure. As a result, left atrial appendage closure during surgery has become a um, standard of care uh, if patients are undergoing surgery for uh, bypass surgery for coronary disease or, or valve disease or a combination thereof if they have atrial fibrillation and a Chad's VASC score of two or more. So these are important data. Um, now, we talked about the Watchman data as it compares with warfarin. Uh, 
Uh, we also talked about the Prague 17, which was uh, which is the only completed and published trial looking at left atrial appendage closure versus DOAC. Uh, we, we seem to uh, believe that the DOACs are much safer than warfarin. So how is left atrial appendage closure going to perform uh, when compared with a DOAC? And these are a list of the ongoing trials which are comparing left atrial appendage closure um, with a DOAC, uh, the catalyst which we are enrolling patients for here at Houston Methodist, closure AFib, champion AFib is completed enrollment, occlusion AFib, and option. These are all large trials, multi-center randomized trials, looking at patients with atrial fibrillation uh, with either the Watchman device or the amulet device in comparison with a DOAC. And these are going to be published over the next few years and will uh, really shed more light um, as to what is uh, better um, in patients uh, with atrial fibrillation at high risk of stroke. Uh, uh, shifting gears a little bit, the DAPT FLEX study. Uh, this looked at patients from the NCDR LAO registry who underwent the Watchman uh, device. And patients were, the, the, about 17,000 patients were included in this study. Uh, and uh, about 2,000 patients were treated with DAPT or dual antiplatelet therapy after the Watchman. About 2,000 were treated with warfarin plus aspirin. Uh, and about 13,000 patients were treated with a DOAC and aspirin for the first six weeks. And when you look at the outcomes on the left, I would like to draw your attention, the outcomes were no different uh, between the DAPT arm in green and the DOAC and aspirin in blue. Uh, no matter how you look at it, the composite head point, uh, risk of death, stroke, major bleeding, and device-related thrombus. There were no statistical differences uh, based on the post-Watchman antithrombotic regimen. Similarly, on the right side, uh, this compares the DAPT with warfarin plus aspirin. Uh, and again, there were no significant differences uh, in regards to death, uh, stroke, bleeding, or device-related thrombus. So this is very important because a lot of these patients uh, are high risk for bleeding and you know they cannot even tolerate the anticoagulation for even six weeks. Uh, the six weeks of anticoagulation is how the PROTECT and the PREVAIL uh, randomized trials were performed. But based on this data, uh, uh, the uh, FDA has now approved uh, a dual antiplatelet therapy for six months uh, uh, after uh, Watchmen. So there are now two options. Um, the option one is, of course, based on the initial randomized trials, which is anticoagulation with either a warfarin or DOAC. Uh, plus aspirin for 45 days, then DAB for six months, and then aspiration indefinitely. The other option, uh, which I think is safer um, in these older patients, is DAB for six months, and then aspirin indefinitely. So these are two options, and uh, this is up to the uh, discretion of the operator, depending on patient risk and individualized shared decision making. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, very important data. Um, moving on, what are the problems with uh, left atrial appendage closure? Uh, we saw from the uh, initial slides that the risk of pericardial effusion and uh, tamponade requiring intervention has gone down substantially, and the risk is now less than 0.5%. But there are still two issues that we should talk about, and one of these issues is device-related thrombus, or DRT. Sometimes we see a thrombus on the device when we do the TEE or CT scan at six weeks, and the incidence has been found to be around 2 to 4%. Uh, and there is a two to four fold increase in risk of thromboembolism in patients who have this device related thrombus. And when you look at the uh, recent studies, the predictors of device related thrombus are age, gender, it's more common in women, permanent atrial fibrillation, patients with left ventricular dysfunction, uh, elevated Chad's VASC score, patients, of course, with coagulopathy and renal disease. So these are not surprising. Uh, there are different classifications that have been proposed uh, based on imaging. And uh, prevention and treatment uh, is, remains a challenge because, you know, one of the most important treatment strategies is anticoagulation. And, of course, these patients are undergoing left atrial appendage closure because they are high risk for bleeding complications. But that remains one of the most important treatment strategies for these patients. Uh, and here are the uh, data. Um, they uh, studied this in, in multi-center registry looking at 200 patients with left atrial appendage closure who developed uh, device-related thrombus on imaging. Um, uh, about 65% of the patients had resolved device-related thrombus after anticoagulation. However, about a third had persistent device-related thrombus. And uh, it was found that these patients who had unresolved or persistent device-related thrombus had a higher risk of stroke or systemic embolism. So this is important. This is an area of uh, uh, growing research.
And, uh, you know, these are, uh, these are still low risk, but these are important to watch for. The other issue is peri device leak after left atrial appendage closure. So in the initial randomized trials, uh, a significant leak was defined as more than five millimeters. And uh, in patients with less than five millimeters of uh, leak upon imaging at six weeks, which was initially all done with TEE, patients could come off anticoagulation. But we are appreciating that this is uh, not so trivial. And even leaks less than five millimeters are important. And you know, the, this depends on imaging. These are more readily picked up on CT scan compared to TEE. Uh, and again, different types of treatments have been described in patients with significant leak, including placement of uh, coils uh, and second devices in some people. But this is, uh, this is uh, a gr area of growing interest. And there is some data to suggest that patients with uh, even small leaks less than five millimeter may be at increased risk of uh, stroke, TIA, or systemic embolization. Uh, this was a recent uh, meta-analysis that was published in the European Heart Journal. Um, very neat study. Uh, they looked at 60,000 uh, plus patients who underwent left atrial appendage closure uh, from 48 studies with available imaging and clinical follow-up. Of course, with CT scan, the incidence of peri-device leak is found to be much higher than TEE. But in the middle of, the, of this figure, you can see uh, based on no, no leak, leak zero to one millimeter, one to three millimeter, three to five millimeter, and more than five millimeter, the risk of uh, stroke or systemic embolism uh, uh, exponentially increases. Of course, the highest risk is with, with leaks more than five millimeters, but these smaller leaks may not be so benign as we initially thought. So there is a lot of uh, interest and uh, uh, research into how do we reduce the incidence of these peri-device leaks. Uh, uh, strategies such as more coaxial placement of the device, larger device sizing to reduce the leak, uh, having more than one device type, uh, and we'll talk about the amulet device. CT for planning has uh, become really important. Uh, longer post uh, LAO uh, antithrombotic therapy uh, may be an option in some of these patients, and lower thresholds for PDL closure. These are all strategies that have been discussed and described to reduce the risk of these PDLs and reduce the risk of embolization or stroke associated with these PDLs. Um, the amulet device, this is the other device which is now approved in the United States. Um, the amulet IDE uh, was a trial of uh, almost 1900 patients and patients, uh, again, non-valvular AFib at high risk of stroke and embolism were randomized to the amulet occluder versus the watchman device, 900 patients uh, in each arm and three year outcomes are presented here. The risk of ischemic stroke or systemic embolism was no different. Um, the risk of stroke, systemic embolism, or, or, or CV death was no different in this trial. Major bleeding, again, very similar. CV death, very similar. All-cause death, similar. Um, or anticoagulation use is, is a little bit different. This was, uh, you know, the amulet device uh, trial was done mainly with dual antiplatelet therapy, so there are differences there. And importantly, um, when you look at the outcome, zero to six months and six months to three years, uh, the incidence of device-related thrombus was no different uh, between the amulet device and the watchman uh, device. However, the incidence of peri-device leak more than three millimeters was found to be much lower in the amulet arm compared to the watchman arm. And that is not surprising because the amulet arm, amulet device has a dual mechanism which has the, the lobe which goes into the appendage and it has a disc which covers the ostium on the outside. So the device design is different compared to the watchman device. Similarly, this is a European trial, the Swiss Apero trial, uh, 200 patients at high risk for AFib and indication for clinical, uh, clinical indication for left atrial appendage closure were randomized to amulet versus watchman, 111 versus 85 patients, and uh, 45 uh, day left atrial appendage patency by the CC, by cardiac CT was similar in both arms. Uh, and uh, amulet was not associated with a lower risk of uh, composite of crossover or residual left atrial appendage patency compared with watchman. Amulet was, however, associated with lower peri-device leaks at TEE uh, and similar clinical outcomes at 45 days compared to the watchman. Uh, the clinical relevance, of course, of uh, CT detected left atrial appendage patency requires further investigation. But uh, again, we are recognizing that even these small leaks may not be so benign. So there are a lot of devices that are undergoing development uh, to improve the, the, the ceiling of the device, to reduce the incidence of peri-device leak, to reduce the incidence of device-related thrombus. And this is a very exciting uh, and evolving field. And uh, you know, we are learning about these devices. The conformal device on the, on the top left is an interesting device which uh, uh, is supposed to conform to the, to the uh, left atrial appendage and uh, potentially has uh, the uh, uh, you know, lower uh, uh, 
uh, Perry device leak. Uh, you know, we, this trial is ongoing. And uh, uh, an exciting device is the uh, laminar device, which is very different. It has this uh, ball and locking mechanism. So here is the ball that is being advanced into the left atrial appendage. The left atrial appendage is sort of twisted like a, like a bread bag, if you will. And then the lock is deployed on the outside to close the appendage completely. So, you know, presumably this would have a much lower risk of better device leak, if any. And uh, the imprint of the device that sticks out of the appendage is also much smaller. And uh, potentially this has, uh, you know, offers an advantage in terms of reduced risk of device-related thrombus also. This is also undergoing clinical trial evaluation. And, uh, you know, these are novel techniques and novel devices that are now being studied for left atrial appendage closure. And then finally, the Watchman Flex Pro, which got FDA approval last year. This is the latest version of the Watchman device, which has hemocode technology uh, to promote faster healing and reduce risk of uh, uh, thrombus. And there are three new uh, radio opaque markers, which are uh, uh, going to make the device uh, easily uh, visible and uh, allow better positioning and placement of the device in the appendage and uh, also newer sizing to allow treatment of a uh, wide range of anatomies. So in conclusion, um, we saw that there is a growing use of left atrial appendage given uh, efficacy and improving safety over the years. The newer device iterations have been found to be much safer compared to the older generation devices. Uh, the importance of peri-device leak and device-related thrombus um, is becoming increasingly recognized, and there are mitigation strategies that are being evaluated to reduce this risk. And of course, there are ongoing trials uh, of left atrial appendage closure versus direct oral anticoagulation, which are going to guide um, uh, this field further. I thank you very much for your attention.